question. Before we move on to wireless sensor networks, uh, actually in market, uh, uh, I'm not too sure about 4G, but it's that's what I've heard that it's on based on Wi-Fi and uh, WebDM basically comes up from Wi-Fi. Its main work is done in Wi-Fi for mobile com to like for cell phone networks as well. For 4G. For 4G. Hmm. Okay. And, um, that's not what I heard. I heard it was based on WiMAX, actually, okay. not Wi-Fi. Uh, and it also, uh, OFDM is uh, this system doesn't use Wi-Fi doesn't use OFDM, okay. uh, or it doesn't until you get to uh, G and N. Actually, I'm not sure if G uses it. I think N does. Um, we basically covered initially that uh, it does support roaming. So I was just wondering I well, if you could get a little bit. More on that. Um, I don't really. I'd, I'd have to prepare something, and I haven't. So I, yeah, I can't really talk about it right now. Uh, but I do. Uh, so on the course schedule, we do have to talk about a bit of a wireless sensor network. So let's do that. Okay, so what's the idea with wireless sensor networks? So this is a fancy term that basically means, um, that basically represents the fact that, for one thing, two-way digital radios are extremely inexpensive right now, and secondly, computing power is extremely inexpensive and small. Uh, what this means is that you can have very small devices, and very small and very inexpensive devices that are capable of two radio communication. So the idea is you get a whole bunch of these uh, very small, very inexpensive devices, um, scatter them over a large area, and use them to sense a physical phenomenon. So the main idea is that lots of data is better than little data. You're in the data gathering business. Um, what you want is you want as much data as possible from as many locations as possible. You want to observe phenomena um, from uh, as many uh, as close to the phenomenon as possible, and you want to do uh, you want to gather as much information as you can. So um, historically, when radios and computing power were expensive would do is you'd build one big honking sensor and sort of drive it around town. And so you'd, you'd, big, you'd, you'd have this, this one device and transport it from place to place uh, taking measurements or you would arrange it so that it could, it could take remote measurements from somewhere else. Um, since computers and radios are cheap, now we don't have to do that. Now we can basically take our sensors and scatter them over here. So one specific example of this, and a, an early huge success of wireless sensor networks, uh, is wire, wireless, uh, excuse me, wildlife tracking. Is that thing with the sharks in the news? Um, I'm actually thinking of uh, uh, zebras. So they did this in Africa. But yeah, there have been there have been a ton of there have been a ton of um, um, so how do you do how do you do wildlife tracking? So what they used to do, I mean, it, it boils down to uh, stapling uh, something to a man. <laughs> so what they used to do, a radio caller. So they did this with people and the house arrest before they did the for the That's true. That's true. So I mean, what? So anyway, um, the the conventional solution of to wildlife tracking is what's. Uh, I mean, we've all heard of radio collars. So they tranquilize an animal and strap a radio collar on it. Uh, so what those were historically were just radio transponders. In other words, um, basically like a glorified. Um, RFID. So in other words, um, they would have a herd of several thousand zebras. Some of them would have radio collars. And what you do is you tranquilize a few of them, put radio collars on them, go away. So at this point, no data is being collected. 
come back with an airplane flight over the herd and emit radio. And the radio transponders would pick up on that and reply. So basically all you'd get is a count and roughly where they were. So that's the old way. The new way is that those radio callers are not transponders, they're actual active sensors and they can talk to each other. So what they, the, the main idea there was that these devices would continuously record the position of, uh, of each member of the herd with, with such a radio caller. And what's more, uh, once they had a critical mass of these things, uh, they could actually route traffic from one radio caller to another to the edge and at the edge of the herd uh, there was another antenna that would pick it up civilization. So they would be continuously monitoring these herds as opposed to just every time they had enough money to rent a Cessna and fly it over the herd. So uh, this is called ZebraNet. <laughs> this actually was not in South Africa. I think it was in, in uh, Tanzania. Oh. Uh, so, uh, so look up. Uh, ZebraNet was, was um, it wasn't the first major application of the sensor network. But it's it's a it's a famous and historical success of one uh, where um, uh, huge amounts of data uh, the, the science of wildlife tracking is transformed by this huge amount of extra data they could they could uh, they could then monitor exactly what the herd was doing at all times not just when they were flying over so they could they could see what's happening at night during the day during bad weather uh, all kinds of all kinds of different things. So this is one example of the transformative uh, possibilities that are available when you have uh, computing and communication all ubiquitous and um, basically distributed everything. So these, these devices organize themselves, they find their neighbors, they automatically route to the edge um, and, and do all that kind of sophisticated stuff. I'm missing their solar power. Um, not necessarily. They can be battery powered. Um, but they have to be designed to be extremely conservative with battery power. Um, the idea would be that I think you'd have, you'd have a, a reasonable sized battery in these things. I mean, uh, zebras are fairly large animals, so they, can, they wouldn't notice like a, a radio car that weighs a few pounds. So you can, pack, you can pack quite a bit of battery. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, so that's another excellent example. So, uh, uh, those are people pushing back. There's a lot of people. Uh, <laughs> oh, I see, uh, I see you're, talking, you're talking about those guys. Uh, I actually don't know what they're doing. Uh, but, <laughs> oh, the people pushing buttons, they're yeah. always uh, asked. <laughs> and they said that we were counting that getting it would be how many people walk through this corridor. But I mean, yeah, you could, you could do that with this. You could have like a vibration sensor somewhere, someone walks by. Uh, other applications of this are like security. Uh, you could have uh, not, just, not just on the doors, but like ubiquitous. So like one sensor every few feet. Uh, so it would be basically impossible for this case. Uh, another, another thing that you could do uh, that people have done, and uh, they've done structural monitoring. So they, they put these on, uh, on, uh, on uh, like um, support columns and buildings just to see if they're, if they're shifting or if they're settling. Doing basically acting the way they're supposed to or not. Um, in fact, there's a clever application of one of those that actually harvests uh, it harvests the energy from the swaying of the building, so it, it never needs battery. Um, so yeah. Anyway, uh, any any application where data is being collected and needs to be collected from a number of different sites is a possible application of sensor networks. Have you seen the 